Hey everybody, I'm wearing my blue shirt because today we're gonna talk about water, which is chapter three. Hi everybody, my name is Mikey from Avo Prep Academy and today we're gonna talk about chapter three. And in a series of videos, what we're gonna try to do is try to cover each chapter that's covered on the AP Biology under 10 minutes. So accounting for about 20 chapters that you need to know in AP Biology, you should be able to get through the entire curriculum or at least the core fundamentals within about three hours. And that hopefully will help you guys prepare for the exam and of course prepare for your curriculum throughout the year. So today we're gonna to talk about chapter three, which is about water. So why is water so important in biology? Well, there are two main reasons. One is that our cells are primarily made up of water. It's gonna be about 70 to 80% water. And all of the biological reactions that we care about in AP biology happens within the context of water. So that's really important. And another reason is that early on, before Earth had any life, we believe that life came to be through a process called abiogenesis in some sort of an aqueous environment, probably near the hydrothermal vents in the primordial soup, as we call it. So for those reasons, we need to understand why water is so important, resulting from its structure and the properties that water has. So let's go ahead and start talking about the structure of water, because that's going to be really important in understanding exactly why water behaves the way it does. So water is a polar covalent molecule. So we need to understand what that means. So polar covalent molecule has two parts. One is covalent and the other is polar. So let's first talk about the covalent part of this. Covalently bonded molecules, as you guys probably have learned in chemistry, are molecules that are comprised of atoms which share valence electrons. And in the case of water, it has a central oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms in a bent fashion with two pairs of electrons that are being shared between the oxygen and the hydrogen atoms. And the most important part of all this is that polarity that forms when you have a water molecule. Well, you see the oxygen, which has a slightly greater electronegativity than hydrogen, pulls on those electrons that are being shared between the two atoms and the two atoms on either sides. And as a result, the electrons spend way more time near the oxygen atom than they do near the nucleus of those hydrogen atoms, which is essentially a proton anyway. Now, don't get me wrong, there are 10 protons and 10 electrons in the totality of the water molecule, giving water molecule a net charge of zero. But because electrons spend way more time near the oxygen atom, we say that this causes the oxygen atom side of the water molecule to have a slightly negative charge and the hydrogen sides to have a slightly positive charge. And this is what we call polarity because the ends of these molecules are electrically different. Now, remember that in AP Biology, we don't really want to think in terms of electricity, but think more in terms of magnetism. In fact, I think there was a physicist who said that they were the same things anyway. But what do I know? I'm a biologist. So the point is, if you think about a bunch of magnets, which has the north and the south side, and you put them in a big basket and you shake them about, what's gonna happen? Well, all the magnets are gonna stick together, and that's exactly what happens with water molecules too. If you take a look at a diagram of water molecules and their interactions with other water molecules, you'll see that they form a very important interaction that we call hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding allows water molecules to form these intermolecular attractive forces between them, which then results in one water molecule interacting with four water molecules, and each of those four water molecules interacting with other four water molecules, and when you have a bunch of water molecules, they all stick together. And because of this behavior of water, we say that water has this emergent quality, the emergent property that arises, or rather emergent properties that arise, and there are gonna be four of them that you need to know for AP Biology. So let's go through those four, and then we'll be done with this entire chapter. So number one is adhesion, cohesion, and surface tension. So that's actually three. But anyway, it's all comprised into a single category in AP Biology, or at least in chapter three anyway. And the whole point of this is that adhesion, ad meaning two, and hesion meaning stick. So water molecule has the ability to stick to other things that are also polar or charged. So for example, if you see a morning dew forming on a blade of grass, then what's happening is that the water molecule is attracted to the slightly negative and positive components that are on the surface of that leaf. So it almost seems to defy gravity because it sticks up there without dropping to the ground. And another property that we see here is cohesion. Co meaning together, hesion meaning stick. And in this case, cohesion allows water molecules to stick together, which is why you see that meniscus when you have water in a tube, or why water seems to form bubbles or droplets when you actually have them on the surface of a table or something like that. Now, the last part is surface tension, and that's the degree to which water can hold onto each other, forming a thin surface 
on top of a body of water, which is really important because it allows for things like water striders and lily pads to float about, and that creates an entire ecosystem for different organisms that utilize that surface tension. Ah, and that's important because we also need to think about why these properties of water are very important for biology. So then adhesion and cohesion are also important for other functions in biology as well. Specifically, the example that your textbook likes to give you is the movement of water across the xylem of plants. So for example, if you have a really big tree and water is moving from the soil all the way to the top of the canopy, what's happening is that through a vascular tissue called xylem, water is moving through using what we call capillary action. But in order to do this, water has to literally climb up the xylem using its adhesive nature. And it also has to use cohesion to pull the water molecules beneath it in order to form that continuous column of water. So that's why it's important. And as we've seen before, obviously water's ability to stick together or stick to other substances that are polar or charged is going to explain why this property of water arises. The second property of water that we need to know is what we call its high specific heat. So this is actually a pretty complicated equation, but if you've taken chemistry and you've done some calorimetry problems, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. The specific heat of any substance is the amount of energy or the amount of heat that you need to add to that substance in order to change its temperature. Now the actual calculation for this involves things like grams and temperature and well, lastly, the specific heat and the thermal energy, which I'm going to put up on the screen right now. But all you need to know is why this is relevant for biology for the time being. So let's think about water. All of these organisms evolved in water. And imagine for a moment that water did not take a lot of energy to change its temperature. That means every morning when the sun rises up, water could potentially boil from the oceans and go into the atmosphere. Or every time the sun goes down, water rains down from the skies and forms the oceans again. In this type of volatile environment, there's no way that any organism would have evolved. And thus, the ability of water to resist changes to its temperature is incredibly important for not only the survival of aquatic organisms right now, but also the ability to moderate temperature of our internal systems. Like for example, our internal temperature being about 36 and a half or 37 degrees Celsius, it's stable and stability is good for homeostasis. So it matters biologically. Now in terms of why this relates to let's say the polarity of water. The idea of going from a liquid to gas involves the changes in the interactions of the molecule from sticking with each other, maybe creating that little bit of a flow and viscosity to completely separating from each other. And if water molecules are as sticky as they are, it's going to take more energies to break down all of those hydrogen bonds in order to turn that liquid into gas. And even within the liquid form, that resistance to change in temperature is exemplified by that second property of water. The third property of water is its ability to expand upon freezing. And this time we're going the other way, cooling it below zero to turn it into ice. Now, if you've ever had a glass of Coke with some ice cubes in it, you would know that the ice cubes float above the Coca-Cola drink. And the reason for that is that less dense things tend to float. And less dense means you have more volume per same mass, meaning that it's been expanded. So when water molecules go from liquid to solid, the structure is such that it expands and as a result, ice floats on top of water. So why is this important for biology? Well, if you think about a small body of water, the interaction with water and its external environment or the atmosphere is where majority of that temperature exchange is going to occur. So if the air temperature is super cold, then the surface of water becomes cold and then it sort of permeates through the water down below. However, if the water at the surface tends to freeze first, then what happens? You get a nice thin layer of ice at the top, meaning that the water below low can be insulated further from the temperature on the outside, meaning that even in the dead of winter, when it's like minus 30 degrees outside, you still have liquid water existing below this thin layer of ice. And that allows for aquatic organisms in small bodies of water, or even large bodies of water, depending on where you are, to survive over winter. And that, again, stability is extremely important for organisms to thrive and adapt and evolve into the array of organisms that we see today.
Now, the last property of water, which is actually the most important one in terms of what you're going to be covering in Unit 2 and Unit 3, is water's ability to act as a solvent. Now, in this scenario, we're talking about a very specific chemical term called solutions. Now, solutions are a homogeneous mixture of solutes like salt dissolved in solvents like water. And the example that I just gave you, you guys know because you probably have mixed some salt into your water if you have inflamed gums and you, or you wanted to prank your brother or your sister into drinking salty water. But the point is, the salt seems to disappear. Now, as you guys know, the salt is not actually disappearing. What's happening is that the salt molecules are dissolving in water. So what does that mean to dissolve? Well, dissolving means that the salts, sodium and chlorine ions dissociate from each other. And because they're farther away, you can't really see them. So how is that happening? Well, earlier today, we learned that water has a slightly negative side at the oxygen end and slightly positive sides at the hydrogen end. So when the salt crystals enter water, the slightly negative oxygen associates with the sodium ions, which are positive and forms what we call hydration shell and vice versa with chlorine the hydrogen sides which are slightly positive surround the chlorine ions and separate it from the sodium ions and as a result these move farther away from each other seemingly disappearing to our naked eye but it's not just ionic compounds that dissolve while in water see even larger substances like proteins that have any semblance of polarity about its external structure can also dissolve in water very well so to put simply water dissolves things that are either charged positive or negative or polar which means slightly negative or positive as well. So anything that has a charge or a slight charge, water will dissolve. Now, because we care about water so much in biology, we actually use a very specific term to describe the properties of substances that dissolve well in water, and that is hydrophilic. Hydro meaning water and philic meaning to love. And there are things that do not dissolve in water. The things that do not dissolve in water are going to be called hydrophobic, as in water fearing and in this category we're talking about lipids or large hydrocarbons which are all non-polar and the reason that this is important is that as we learn about things like cell membranes and photosynthesis or even the interactions of hormones to the receptors on the membrane or steroid hormones that go straight through the membrane all of this is going to involve your knowledge of how water interacts with different substances differently and the idea of hydrophobic and hydrophilic substances interacting with water differently. And that about sums up water. Now, I know that there's a last bit of the chapter regarding acids and bases. However, for that, I think you guys probably want to review that section of chemistry in a slightly more in-depth sense. Now, I'm not sure how long that took. But if you guys like this video, press the thumbs up, click subscribe, because we're going to be going through chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, 6, 7, well, actually probably a lot of chapters in the coming videos. So if you like this content, we'll see you again next time. This has been Mikey from Avo Prep Academy. Have an awesome day.